On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we talk about why tennis serves may be less stressful on the UCL than baseball pitching. We talk about athletic trainers performing manual therapy on personal training clients. And we talk about cash based. Cash based. Cash based. Cash based. How, how to start a little cash-based side business. The Ask Mike Reinald Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Hi, everybody. This is Mike Reinald, and welcome to the latest episode of the podcast. I'm here with Lenny Macrina, Mike Reinald, Dan Pope, some fantastic students, and Dave. We have some fantastic questions for you on this fantastic episode. (laughs) It's going to be fantastic. We, we like Scaduto. Keep going. Scaduto is going to be here uh, next month. <laughs> <He's on sabbatical. laughs> Keep going. Do we have students? Keep going. Let's introduce yeah. the students. I don't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> I rehearsed this morning. Yeah. I don't know their last names. So. <laughs> All right. What do we have for students here? I'd like you did a good job last time. But let me see. We'll start off. Alicia <coughs> Noah's Archangelo. Yes. Isn't that what you did last time? Oh, yeah, yeah. From the University of St. Elizabeth's of Josephine. It's so proper with their college. <laughs> Where are you from? St. Francis. St. Francis. St. Francis. 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 And then a new student to introduce to the crowd. This is a big one. We're excited about this. He's done a great job in his, what, like two weeks? Is it two weeks? We had first two weeks. Brian Winkler. Winks! From the University of <laughs> Delaware. I, that would probably be cooler to them listening to it than us. It's kind of like crickets. Isn't there a famous <laughs> baseball player, pitcher, who's pitching right now that's a similar name to K? Isn't it a K name? No. K? Yeah. Chris Bond? Chris Sale. No. <laughs> <laughs> With a K? <laughs> <laughs> when you strike Kershaw? somebody out, you yeah, Kershaw, yeah, yeah, Kershaw, yeah, yeah, so. Kershaw, 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 yeah. Way to make a baseball. I know. Oh, I was really proud of myself. That that was was like they had so many touchdowns last week. <laughs> that was awesome. All right, who's starting first? Where do you want to go? All right, senior Al- students. Alicia, just flexing a little seniority right there. I'm first. All right, Joey from New York. Why do tennis players have less Tommy John injuries than baseball pitchers? Okay. You guys, are going to just talk to Lenny. <laughs> no, all right. So why why do tennis players have less Tommy John injuries than baseball? I'll let you start on that, Lenny. Yeah, I mean it's a different motion completely. I don't think they're getting into that end range layback position. They are holding a racket, which probably put a little bit more torque on the elbow. But um, I guess it's just the it's not that end range layback that we see in baseball and the volume of oh, they hit a lot of balls. But it's just I guess it's the position. I think the shoulder is in. The force ends up through the wrist and the racket more, doesn't it? When you like, uh, yeah, but I don't think that's where you get strain. No. You get strain on layback. Yeah. And then you could argue it's like a ski. The racket actually increases the lever arm and increases mm. the stress. Right. Yeah. In theory, I would think. I, I, I mean, I, I catch what you're trying to say, but I don't. I don't know. I, I, I've never really studied in depth the, the tennis motion to see how far back they get into external rotation. It's a bunch, but for the serve. And I think, Correct, that, yeah. I think that's the main right. component mm-hmm. right here. And there are some biomechanical yeah. studies. I'm pretty sure Fleissig, I think Steve Baratai maybe did it back in the day. But, um, you know, ASMI, I think, has published that the, between the two. Um, it's it's the serve. It's similar layback. Yeah. And I will say, you know, we're good friends with Todd Ellenbecker. He's been the, you know, head PT of the ATP, a lot of letters, uh, tour. Is it a tour? ATP a- tour? Yes. American PG- Tennis Professionals Tour. ATP Association of Tennis Players yeah. um, at the University of, of France, St. Francis. Is he in the but APTA? They, um, he's, in the, he's a PT <laughs> in the APTA that works for the ATP Tour. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was worth it. I think he's a personal trainer. Too. Oh. <laughs> All right, so, um, but no, I mean, I've talked to Todd about this quite a bit, and tennis players get Tommy John injuries. I mean, one, it's probably not as big of a national stage, too, right? So you don't really talk about it quite as much. You know, you don't see it quite as much. But I think the main thing it comes down to is pure volume. Yeah. You know, they yeah. tennis players do not serve as much as baseball players pitch. Yeah, I guess. You know, and then they yeah. pra- they're practicing forehand, backhand, you know, stuff like that. Pitchers are pitching, yeah. right? And every time you pitch, there's stress on it. Um, I just think it's an it's the volume and workload is enormously different in baseball. If they just serve for the whole game, they probably have a lot more time. That's, I wonder if 100% they do, <laughs> do weighted rackets. Right. Like we do they weighted do. 
did. They did. They definitely do. They did. That's how I learned about it, gymnastics and ankle weights. They definitely do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, no, like, it, it, so I definitely think it's workload yeah. related, right? But remember, you know, baseball player, what does a baseball player do to practice? They probably long toss. Well, they throw, right. so that's right. bad. And they long toss, they yeah. do stuff like weighted ball sometimes. Yeah. Those are equal to or surpassing the stress of pitching. Right. So a tennis player practices by doing forehands and backhands, much less stressful on on the, the ligament. So, you know, I don't I don't think it's a fair fight. I don't think it's a fair comparison. Yeah. I don't think we can say they have less. Like, I guess, yes, they technically have less, but there isn't something magical about tennis that we can extrapolate to baseball to have, to somehow you know, right. I play Mario it. tennis on a Wii, and my elbow is definitely sore. <laughs> right, right. I agree. I it's actually, fantastic. I agree with that. Yeah. And bowling, you put those two together. Nice. Wii bowling. Yeah. yeah. Solid. Yeah, yeah, rates are very high. I thumb, agree. Thumb injury. Uh, who's next? Yeah, Wings. 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 All right, Danny from Boston. Yeah. Hi everyone. I have been a longtime listener of your podcast, and thank you for the great discussions and information. I'm an athletic trainer and CSCS, and I'm currently in a strength and conditioning internship. After my internship, I would like to work in the strength and conditioning field, but utilize the skills and knowledge of athletic training, such as manual therapy and instrument-assisted soft tissue work with athletes and or clients. How would I go about doing this, or is there a setting, high school, college, private sector, more suitable for this type of position? Well delivered. I, 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 that, that was, was that not the best yeah. first time student? <laughs> I, I, great things are coming here, people. <laughs> I am, I'm telling you. This, I mean, the price is right now, this right? Is, right? This is, this, I mean, way to be wings. All right, so a, a good question, right? We have an ATC, athletic trainer, CSCS, who is really enjoying strength and conditioning and wants to work in strength and conditioning, but also wants to do stuff like manual therapy. What do you guys think? Who wants to start that one? Poster, it's all you. Yeah, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I mean, uh, the exposure I've had working with athletic trainers, uh, it's been tough for them to do manual techniques in the high school setting is basically what I have familiarity with. Just because after school they're bombarded with, you know, 100 athletes mm -hmm. and they have like 15 to 30 minutes to get everyone moving. They have no time at all to do any sort of manual technique. Uh, the one thing I will say is that the athletic trainers that uh, I work with also work with uh, physiotherapy associates. So they would come into the clinic twice a week and they would help out with uh, the therapist there. And they actually had a, a good chance to do a lot of manual techniques there and that was that was probably a good setting um, for them to practice their skills so that yeah. might be worthwhile but to yeah, be honest, you, I don't think I, so I think your main point here that we should probably harp on is that I don't think as an athletic trainer you legally can do manual therapy on your strength clients right so I think so to, to I kind of elaborate on Dan's point right there I think if you want to do that you probably need to be in a multidisciplinary setting right with probably either physical therapy or physicians or something but you know I'm an athletic trainer. Am I the only athletic trainer? You guys yeah. aren't athletic. I, I'm an athletic trainer. We have to work under the direction of a physician right so it's a little bit different. If you're in a state where as an athletic trainer you can also work as like a PT aide or like a tech that may also be there but then you got to then look at the definitions can an aide do manual therapy. I can only speak to the college setting. We had a kind of a split role for our ATCs, and I don't know if this is under the physician that was at our college, but if we wanted, like Dan said, in the 30 minutes before practice, it was like trying to herd cats. It was crazy, like how many people needed stuff, but we would come in the middle of the day, in the morning, and we would get like treatment and rehab for like injuries. And so I don't know if that was, because we had a head ATC, yeah. then we had students and we had stuff, so I don't know if that was under the physician, if not, but yeah. we definitely had like the morning stuff was for like yeah. you know, therapy, whatever you uh, mean. Legality wise, that was definitely under the direction okay. of the physician, right? Like that's that's how that, that yeah. model works. But I think the main question here though is, he wants to work as a strength coach. Right. And he wants to do manual therapy on his strength I clients. I think it's different services. And your personal yeah. training clients yeah. almost. Yeah. And I don't know, I just, I legally, I don't know if you can. Sounds like we need to go back to massage therapy school. I know, yeah. Might be <laughs> I know, isn't that insane? Isn't that insane? For yeah. you to legally do that, you could... Yeah, there's a... Yeah, wow. I guess le legality-wise, you just gotta... That's a risk. If you're willing to take that risk, I don't know if I would, though. Yeah, I mean, and, and, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's my understanding of it. So I, I'd be real careful with that. I don't know if you can kind of combine those two worlds in quite the way you want to, uh, legality-wise. Close. but Yeah, it's super close. I think you can get there, but... All right, K-Bomb, what do we got? All right. A sad Orioles fan from Maryland. I'm hoping to create a little side hustle by setting up a cash-based system at a CrossFit gym or golf course a few days a week. How would I go about starting this up? 
All right, so PT wants to start a little side hustle, kind of going over to like a CrossFit box or any gym or a golf course and start a little cash-based practice. Has anybody done that? I did. You did that? Did you do that, Dan? Uh, I, you know, I had a lot of people ask me about it and I never actually went out and did it, but. <laughs> Why not? Well, I had a million things going on. Yeah. Um, I was working full-time as a PT. I was trying to travel and speak. I was trying to grow my own business. I was trying to take care of my health and, you know, have friends and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Work-life balance. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did Although, this time-wise for me. Yeah. I can't say I did mine strictly as my own cash-based business. It was an extension of my clinic that I already had. That's true. So you didn't do cash I did it so. one day per week there with right. patients. At, at a thing, so. Yeah, I, 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 it's interesting. I, I know a lot of people reach out to us and me on social media and ask questions about it, but I would consult like a lawyer or something like that to start off because yeah. there's so many things to, I mean, you need an NPI number, you need, um, you got to register with the state, you got to make sure that you're not billing under your own NPI number at the job you're currently in if you're in an insurance-based model because uh, by law, if you are, then you need to bill insurance for the private people that you're seeing that you think is cash-based. So there's so there's the legality aspect of it, and then there's the whole getting the clients. Yeah, have you marketed and have that group of people that wanna that wanna just you know be with you? Sounds like you maybe have an interest or have somebody access to a CrossFit box or a golf facility, which is awesome. That's half the battle. But at legality-wise, not to hit the the legal aspect of it again, yeah. but. You gotta make sure you yeah. can you can collect cash. Yeah, start there, right? Yeah. You know, and I, I, that's a good point. We talked about that quite a bit. I think if you're in network with a certain insurance, m many insurances do not allow you yeah. to bill cash for them. So you have to be like super careful with that, and that may vary per insurance carrier. You yeah. know, there's lots that you need to start looking into. Lot. I think yeah. for that. So you know, it, this is the side hustle conversation. When you just go completely out of network, this all kind of gets thrown out. Right. But I think that's a big one. Then don't forget, you need like some, you know, probably need better professional liability insurance. You need to make sure that, that it's, it's okay with your state licensing board, right? That, you know, maybe you have to consider that like a, you know, a facility, you know, like in Massachusetts, we have PT facilities that we have to do. You know, we have to pay more money a year. Um, you know, that sort of thing. You have to be careful with all that. So, you know, I, you got some homework to do, I think. And then maybe while you're doing that though, start some relationships. Yeah. So, you know, if you get a couple boxes, go work out there, go train there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, I never took any of these opportunities up, but I can't tell you how many boxes there was an opportunity to do that. Right. And most of the people that have started their own businesses inside of a CrossFit box have been a member there. And then what happens is you build a tremendous amount of trust with these guys and they really, really want help. So what I would do is I would get people to come back to the clinic where I worked at. So I was actually able to see those people. The other piece is that I was coaching at a, at a box too. And I can't tell you, like every single night, I'd probably have at least five people come up to me and ask questions. So if you are inside of a box or you're friendly with the coaches, if you're treating coaches actively, um, those opportunities will pop up. So I think that's key, authenticity to an extent too, right? Like if you've never done CrossFit and you just want to walk in there and give out business cards, probably not going to go well. Yeah. I remember too, like you can kind of like you said, as you're developing your kind of legality aspect, because you can do consulting, you can teach, you can do seminars, you can kind of... You know, right. that, I, I did that a lot, not that I was looking to make a cash-based business, but that was how I got my foot in the door with a couple of gyms. I was like, can I just come for a half hour and like give, talk about shoulder stuff? Or yeah. We don't have anything official, but I think a good couple of resources are Jared Cotter out of Texas and Aaron LeBauer out of South Carolina, I believe. If you check those guys out, they may be able to help you. Awesome. Great. Great questions. Good episode. Good job, everybody. Students, way to be. Love it. Um, head, I don't, what do I say at the end? Kind of you guys, head over to Mike Ryan on the podcast. <laughs> Rate Mike us review. Click on the link for the podcast. You can ask us questions, anything you want. Head to iTunes and rate, review, subscribe. And we're on. I, I'm digging us on Spotify right now. I'm a big Spotify, Spotify. fan. I don't know. I'm, I've started listening to podcasts on Spotify. It's okay. It's okay. There's better players out there. I'm but anyway, right now. But yeah, crushing it. Do that. Bye.